Lambert, thank you for joining us today to talk about how we can get better judgment in assessment. Is there a move towards more oral and practice-based assessment? Well, I, th I think that is a change. Uh, there has been a, quite a long period of dominance of assessment seeing it as testing and the dominant domination of test theory to, to control that, to control the quality. And what we're seeing is an increased focus on the role of assessment as a part of the educational process rather than uh, purely as testing. But even that the role of oral examinations using the assessor doesn't really discharge us from, uh, from making sure that every assessment we do is fair and credible and trustworthy. And in that respect, issues like validity are still very important. Validity as in, are you actually testing what you want to test or assessing as, as what you want to test? But um, Unlike 10 to 20 years ago, the concept of validity has been made much broader and it caters to uh, educational assessment much better now than it used to do 10, 20 years ago. So what's so different about oral and practice-based assessment? Well, the whole notion about uh, are we doing a good job in assessment, again the validity notion has become much more argument-based. and. I have to explain a bit about the background because um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to assess, evaluate something that's in the candidates or the students' head that we can't observe directly and we have to infer that from what a candidate does, says, etc. And um, so we're trying to, s to evaluate something which is invisible by inferring from the things that we can see. Uh, and that's not easy because that means that you have to build a train of arguments from what I'm seeing to what i assuming that you are like, that what your ability is, what your competence is, what your knowledge is. And um, where formerly that was very numerical in terms of we look at test scores and we see whether they behave accordingly what we're seeing now is that it's much more uh, um, a train of words, uh, a train of thoughts and a train of arguments. And why is that so difficult for examiners? Well, one of the arguments you have to make is when you, you can only see so many things. If, if you have an oral examination or give a student a multiple choice examination, there is a finite number of items, observations, tasks, essays. But you're not interested in only the score or the result of that finite set of items. Actually, you want to infer a sort of infinite conclusion. Uh, I'm not interested in your knowledge on these 10 items. I'm interested in your knowledge per se, which is called the generalization problem. In any research you have a sample and you want to uh, generalize towards the whole population and in assessment you have a small sample and you want to generalize as to uh, general abilities, competence, knowledge. Uh, that's a very big, that's a central problem in, in the validity argument. How do you solve it? Well the traditional approach is very simple. Um, it says you have to sample. The bigger your sample the better the generalization. That's also in research. The larger your sample, uh, the better you can generalize or draw statistically significant conclusions. Um, but the problem is that in many modern assessment situations, we can't simply sample. There is often in workplace-based assessment, for example, or workplace-based learning, there is one supervisor and one trainee. So I can't simply say, oh, we need 10 supervisors because we haven't got them. Um, the other thing is that uh, simply sampling may not capture the whole picture. Uh, sampling reduces randomness in, in the decisions, but it doesn't reduce biases in the decisions, systematic deviations, it doesn't do it. it so. But fortunately there is much emerging research that shows us that assessors are actually, uh, being an assessor is actually an expertise quite similar to uh, clinical diagnostic expertise, for example, or in many other diagnostic expertise fields like in chess or 
in law. Uh, but, so it's 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 a, a very similar type of expertise, and that's that's quite convenient because we know of those types of expertise, and I'll, 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 I'll use clinical expertise or diagnostic expertise as an example. What we do know is that it develops by uh, building scripts, chunks. In the beginning you have to memorize individual symptoms, they chunk into disease entities and then you can recognize disease entities. And the same applies to assessors. In the beginning you have to memorize everything a student does, but once you've built experience, you are able to sort of store that in your memory as one whole. And that's good news because what we know about experts, there are a couple of things known about experts as compared to non-experts in, in all different fields. First of all, they're much more efficient in diagnosing. They reach a good diagnosis very quickly. So an expert assessor would come to a good conclusion, a valid conclusion, much sooner than a non-expert uh, uh, assessor. Um, they're qu quicker able to rule out irrelevant information. I don't have to consider this. This is not going to help me, that type of information. So they're sort of their generalization to the universe from the sample is much better and much richer than a non-expert. And that's the good news. Why is it that experts have more accurate representations of the universe? Well, I've already told you about the scripts and the chunks. Um, how we um, memorize things that are meaningful to us through what, we've, what we know much easier. It's much easier if you have to translate, suppose you had to copy a text. If you had to do that from an English text onto a white sheet of paper, that would be easy for you, slightly more difficult for me. If you had to do a Dutch text, I'm Dutch, for me it would be easy, but for you it would be more difficult because Dutch is not your native language, so you, have, you would have to memorize shorter, smaller bits of information. So you had to you would have to move more often between the sheets of paper. If you had to copy a Chinese text, then you wouldn't even have the chunks of letters because you would have to memorize all the, the dashes and dots and arcs, what have you. So it's these chunks that can be very big into scripts, and these scripts are basically sort of stored memories. So if you're an experienced assessor, you've seen many students, You've had many situations, you've worked your way through many individual situations, and they're sort of are stored as amalgamated experiences, which will then allow you to easy, easily recognize, oh, okay, I've seen such an example before, I've seen such a script before. But, and the problem with novices, and we all have to do that, because there is so much information we can't process that, we can't store that. So we all have to do that. We all have to revert to sort of biases, or to sort of scripts. And the problem is with novices, they reduce the information based on certain elements, like the first impression or the final impression, uh, or, or uh, re related to something they've just seen the day before. And that's called a bias, or use a stereotype, that's called a bias. But the problem is you can't train out biases. What you have to work on is produce rich scripts, expert scripts, out of the biases, and see the biases as unripe scripts rather than something that you would have to train out. Could you please tell us more about these biases? Well, there is one example, uh, I've just mentioned it. It's uh, the first impression. And the first impression is a very strong bias. Actually, we, we all know it and we all use it. Uh, many languages have sayings about first impression, and the, the, the typical uh, English one is, you never get a second chance for a first impression. Uh, the Dutch one is more blunt and says, the first strike is worth two dollars. Um, but the first impression counts, and we know that, and many people uh, have that first impression. In an examination, when you make a good f first impression as a student, then basically the, the assessor has to um, refute his or her own first impression. And it's more difficult than to acknowledge or to, to, to affirm their, uh, their first impression. So first impression or primacy effects are a difficult one. 
The other one is completely the opposite, a recency effect. Um, so the last impression that counts. Um, the, the typical other one which is very often known is called the halo effect. We ask our assessors to judge on various elements, various factors, for example, uh, 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 knowledge, professionality, uh, 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 the skills, uh, etc. And then it turns out that assessors, we humans are not very good in distinguishing these three different factors. Students know that. That's why you dress nicely when you go to an examination or you shake hands and you behave very politely because you make a good impression. And people think, oh, so people who dress nicely are probably smarter than people who don't dress nicely, which is a halo, which is a bias and a halo effect. Uh, other types of effects have to do with our memory. Our memory is not as perfect as we uh, think it is. It's quite fallible. It's quite easy to introduce false memories. And it's quite easy to forget things. And uh, the former is called errors of commission. And the, the latter is called errors of omission. And then finally, there are all kinds of comparative biases, like um, the, uh, the, the saliency effect. I've just seen a very horrible case, and now I relate everything to this horrible case, a, very, a case that made a strong impression. Uh, the anchoring, I've seen a very poor performance now, and the second, so I'm, I'm, I'm more lenient in the second performance. Um, so all kinds of, of, of comparative biases. We're not good at looking at things independently. We all, always judge things in respect to what has been seen and judged previously and what we expect to judge afterwards. What do examiners need to do to address these biases? First of all, like in any building of expertise, have knowledge about it. If you don't know it, you don't recognize it. The, th the second thing they have to do is recognize situations. There's very prototypical situations. So you know about it, that's what I'm telling you. Now you see it in action. The third thing they have to do is recognize it in different contexts because you might recognize it in a prototypical case, but it doesn't mean that you recognize that two dissimilar cases are basically the same sort of bias. And the, f the next step would be to try it out in an authentic situation, in, in actually an examination situation, and, and trying it out and coming up with your own examples. That way you will have, uh, you'll quickly develop knowledge, expertise again, expertise about these type of problems, how to recognize them, how to diagnose them, and therefore how to be less susceptible to them. All right, we'll leave it to the examiners to do all of that. Uh, good idea. <laughs>